refreshments and fellowship on the front lawn after the service. There will be a brief meeting of the Ladies of Wings on the front lawn today, and uh, a couple of items have come up for discussion, so thank you. These are all the announcements. <coughs> Well, friends, good morning. Good to see all of you. Fam familiar faces and a few newer ones. We're here to worship the Lord together. So can I ask if, you, if you're able, let's stand and let's sing Holy, Holy, Holy. the King, number 313.
Let's talk to the Lord. Let's pray. O oh God, today we would join with the psalmist who invites us to come and sing to the Lord. Help us in our worship today to make a joyful noise to you, the rock of our salvation. We come into your presence with thanksgiving. We want to make a joyful noise to you with songs of praise. Because you, Lord, are a great God. You're a great king above all others. In your hands are the depths of the earth. And the heights of the mountains belong to you as well. The sea is yours because you made it. And the dry land too which you formed with your own hands. Oh come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel to the Lord our maker. O oh Lord our God. We're the people of your pasture. We're the sheep of your hand. Today, as we worship you, help us to listen to your voice and to really hear what you're saying to us and respond to you with love and with joy and with obedience. Yet even, Lord, as we pray for that, we recognize that we fall short and so we would take this moment to confess our sin to you. Let's read our prayer of confession together. Holy wisdom, almighty God, with our lips we acclaim you as Lord, yet often in our hearts and lives we deny your reign. We confess our foolishness in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. According to your abundant mercy, forgive us our sins and clothe us in the righteousness of Christ so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Dear friends, hear the good news. Through the blood of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we have redemption. We have the forgiveness of sins. The riches of God's grace have been, have been poured out upon us. Praise be to our God, who has chosen and made us his own, who forgives and cleanses us, who blesses us beyond our imagination. Thanks be to God. As God has given us peace through Christ, so let us share the peace of Christ with one another. In a moment, greet each other with words that feel most natural to you. From the peace of the Lord be with you to God's peace or just peace. So may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Share that with each other. Peace, peace, Lord. Peace, Alice. And online church family, peace to you as well. You can continue those greetings over cold drinks after worship this morning out on the lawn. For now, let's continue in our praise. We're going to sing through two modern songs of praise. Lord, I lift your name on high and shout to the Lord. And we'll sing each of these choruses through two times. Let's stand together. Lord, I lift your name on high.
does for us? Why do you think we love her? Does she cook my breakfast? No. No. <laughs> no. Does, she, um, does she clean up after herself? No. Um, does she do anything to help me out? Yeah. She needs to go for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon 
and say, yes, he makes me, she, Georgie helps me go for a walk. Well, that's true, Sharon. You've got a good point. Why do we have Georgie? You know, we don't need Georgie to do something for us in order to love her. We love her because we love her because she's just a precious little dog and she's brought joy into our life. As you can see, that's her sitting on the step at our house. And children, why does God love us? Because we do our homework, because we pick up after ourselves, because we make God. Well, why, do, why does God love us? Because He made us. Oh, because He made us. That's a beautiful answer, and that's a true answer. Why does God love us? God loves us because He loves us. There's no deeper answer than that. It's not because we do something for God that will make God love us more or make God love us any less. God loves us because God is love. There's a wonderful verse in the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31 verse 3. And this is, this is God speaking to the children of Israel, to his people. And, and God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued to be faithful to you. What does everlasting mean? I have loved you with an everlasting love. Everlasting means forever. You can't go back and find a time in the past when God didn't love you. And you can't go forward into the future and find a time when God will not love you. God loves us forever. Not because we deserve it, not because we earn it, but because God is love. I think it's some of that love that God put in our hearts when we picked up Georgie from the breeder and we were able to take her home and make her a part of our family. But children, I hope that you remember too that God loves you because God is love. And no other reason than that. All we can do is say, Lord, thank you. And I love and we love you too. So let's pray before you go back and sit down and we go through the rest of our service. Dear God, thank you for Georgie and for other parts of your creation like dogs and cats and other pets. For other parts of your creation like hills and valleys and flowers and trees that remind us of how beautiful you are. Because Lord, you are our creator. You're the one who created us, and you love us with an everlasting love. Help us, Lord, to really hear that and believe that deep inside, knowing that we are loved, so that we can respond with love for you. Lord, bless our church family, and especially now in this hour, meet with us anew and afresh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. The scripture reading today is Psalm 15, and it's uh, found on page 546 and on page 845 in the large print Bible. Oh Lord. Who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell in, on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord who stand by their oath, even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest, and do not take a bribe against the innocent, 
Those who do these things shall never be moved. This is the word of the Lord. I hope you're paying attention to that tune because we're going to sing it next week. It's a short chorus. He knows my name, the God who knows us and loves us. Well, the title of the message today is, Who Can Enter the Sanctuary? The other day I came across a list of qualifications for the perfect pastor. Have you heard it? It says the perfect pastor preaches exactly 12 minutes. He or she condemns sin bluntly, but never hurts anybody's feelings. The perfect pastor makes a very modest salary, but wears good clothes, drives a new car, buys good books, and donates most of their salary to the church. The perfect pastor is 29 years old, but has 40 years experience. <laughs> they have a burning desire to work with children and young people and spend most of their time with seniors. They make home visits to church members every week, but are always in their office to be handy when needed. They always have time to attend every meeting in the church building, but are always busy evangelizing the unchurched. I hope you realize that was a joke. <laughs> but I have seen some church job descriptions with unrealistic requirements that would leave out the Apostle Paul, let alone a regular guy like me. 
I know of a congregation where you'd have to be Jesus to get the job, and I'm not sure they'd even hire him. All of which leads to Psalm 15. The psalm begins by asking a question. O oh Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who can dwell on your holy hill? The tent is the tent of meeting, the, the tabernacle, that portable worship tent that the Hebrew people carried with them to worship God as they made their exodus from Egypt to the promised land. And later, after they'd arrived in the promised land, King David created one permanent place of worship in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, what the psalmist refers to as God's holy hill. That's where King Solomon would, would later build the temple where God's people came to worship right up to the days of Jesus. Psalm 15 was probably sung or recited as a part of the Hebrew worship in Jerusalem when the leaders and the people would enter through the gates of the temple there. It'd be like all of us lining up outside the church building, outside the door, and reciting the, these words together as we walked into the building and climbed up the steps and made our way to our seats. Oh Lord, who can come into this church? Who can be allowed in this sanctuary? Now that's an important question. Who can enter the sanctuary? But the rest of the psalm, whew, it gets kind of tough. Here's the job description. Here's the list of qualifications for anyone worthy of entering into God's presence. It's a daunting list. Always blameless. Always righteous. Never lies. Never slanders. Always treats their neighbors well. Never breaks a promise. Never changes one's mind. Lends freely without thinking of the cost. Liberally gives money away to the poor. So please raise your hand now if that consistently describes you. Anybody? You can count me out too. If Psalm 15's list of entry requirements is accurate, I can't think of one day in my life when I could check all the boxes. I might be able to check certain boxes on some days and other boxes on other days, but I'm pretty sure I don't meet the job requirements. Do you? Close isn't good enough. The psalm is describing more than just a nice person. This is a person whose character is way beyond good enough, whose character is perfect, flawless, faultless. I wonder how ancient Israel received these words. Because if the Old Testament is nothing else, it is honest about the foibles and the failings of almost every character who appears in it. Noah's story ends in a drunken stupor. Have you read that? Abraham got himself into trouble more than once because he lied about Sarah, his wife. Moses was known to lose his cool at a few times. King Saul was a troubled, paranoid ruler in his latter years. King David, King David, described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. David violated just about every part of Psalm 15 at some point in his life. And King Solomon didn't fare much better. And after that, it was mostly all downhill for Israel's leaders. If David himself composed this particular poem, it's hard to believe that when it was finished, David thought to himself, my goodness, that's just a mirror image of me. It wasn't. And it isn't. 
When Psalm 15 asks the question, who can gain entrance into the holy place? It describes a person of blameless moral character and righteous action. But friends, what hope do we have if we can't measure up to the entrance requirements to come into the sanctuary and meet with God? Psalm 15 reminds me of John Bunyan's classic story, The Pilgrim's Progress. When the main character, Christian, struggles to make his way up a steep hill, he's told by a man named Mr. Legality that if Christian can make it up the hill, he'll reach his goal, he'll reach the celestial city. And the burden of sin that he's carrying will fall off his back. But the farther up Christian goes, the harder it gets. Christian attempts to follow every commandment of the law, but the hill gets steeper and steeper until it becomes almost a sheer cliff and he's hanging on by his fingernails. It becomes futile to keep going. He can never be good enough or strong enough or perfect enough to obey all of God's laws. Now, he does get there in the end, but not through that hill. You have to read the rest of the story. But the point I'm trying to make is, trying to obey God's law perfectly and completely is a dead-end road and ends in despair. Because we can't. But there's another way of reading Psalm 15 that's not so hopeless. In my years of teaching up at Tyndale Seminary, I read many sermons on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Probably because that parable ends with the words, go and do likewise. Students would tend to turn that story into a moral lesson that shames people for not being like the Good Samaritan, but then tells them to go out and aspire to be one. Now there's truth in that, but it misses the larger point of that story. What students and the rest of us fail to appreciate is something that most of the early church leaders right away saw in that parable. Most of the church's early preachers and theologians looked at that parable and said immediately, who is the real Good Samaritan? It's Jesus, of course. You see, friends, if you aren't Jesus, you're never going to be like the Good Samaritan perfectly and consistently. Only Jesus can do that. The rest of us should aspire to be more Christ-like, but if that happens, it's all because of grace and only through the power and the inward working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. For us to be a Good Samaritan is never an achievement it comes as a gift. And so it is with Psalm 15. Who is this psalm talking about? Who can enter into God's presence? Jesus, of course, and only Jesus. Again, the ancient Israelites could not have made this conclusion, but I think the author of Psalm 15 knew full well that he was talking about someone that he had never met. And probably he knew deep down that whomever Psalm 15 was describing, it would one day be embodied only by God's Messiah himself. If Psalm 15 is a list of prerequisites to live in God's presence, then on our own, none of us can make it. When you read through the other Psalms and through the rest of the Old Testament, it seems the answer to Psalms, Psalm 15's opening question of who can dwell in God's sacred tent or on his holy hill, the answer is no one. Psalm 15 can lead you to despair. Who could make this possible for us if we have no way of achieving it by ourselves. 
Naturally enough, as Christians reading this poem, we already know the answer. Who can do this for us? Jesus can, and only Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus the Messiah, and Jesus alone. But friends, here's the really good news. When we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, we are brought into a right relationship with God. All our sins and all our selfishness is placed on Jesus, which he freely took upon himself on the cross. And in its place, in a miraculous exchange, he took our sin from us and put it on himself, and he offers us a new set of clothes, changing our filthy rags of sin for new, pure, bright garments. Because in Christ, we are now clothed with the righteousness of Jesus himself. So when God looks at us now in Christ, what does he see? God sees the perfect righteousness of Christ in us. And we fit the bill of Psalm 15 after all. God looks at us and he sees Jesus God looks at us and he sees no sin because Jesus has dealt with that. Now to be sure, we certainly are not perfect yet, not by a long shot, yet spiritually now, we possess all the riches of Christ because he has justified us by his grace. We were crucified with him and raised with him and now we have the privilege of sharing in his resurrection life, his righteousness. Let me close with an example. Do you know what justification means when you print a document on your computer? On our computers today, you can right justify or left justify any document. You know what I mean? It's this. <laughs> Mostly we choose left justify, which means the first word of every line in the document will begin in the same place, in the same column, so that they all line up. Justification for those lines mean that they stand in right relationship with the straight edge of that paper itself. The paper is a straight vertical line along its edges. And for words and lines to be justified with that, they line up. They're as straight as the paper's edge itself. They're in a, a right relationship with the page. Well, there it is. And when we read Psalm 15, it serves like a ruler or a measuring stick. And it's the straight edge of moral behavior against, against which every one of us is measured. Does my life line up with that straight edge? Or am I crooked and jagged and out of alignment at many different points of my life? Most of us have to acknowledge we're largely out of alignment. We're not justified relative to this psalm's straight moral edge. But in Jesus Christ, we have been fully justified by his mercy and grace alone. We line up. We match. We measure up after all. Thanks be to God. Dear people, the point of Psalm 15 is not to give us a moral to-do list so that we can make God happy. And it certainly is not to give us the notion that we can live up to these lofty standards in our own strength. No, we need to stay focused on the grace of God who saves us, and that alone can begin to transform and change us to become like Jesus and thereby into being a Psalm 15 kind of person, blameless and generous and faultless 
and loving. It's good for us to aspire to be and do what this psalm describes. But we should never lose sight of who alone it is that can make us into persons who, as the final line of the psalm says, can never be shaken. The only foundation we know to build on that, to build on what will never be shaken, is Christ alone. May God help us to know that, to believe that, to live that. Holy God, through your word and your Son, you have taught us to love you with our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that in your righteousness, O Lord, we may joyfully obey you and live today with confident praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's stand now and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Receive them, Lord, that they might go to share the good news of Jesus around this neighborhood and across the world. In his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray to the Lord. God of all kindness, you gave your only Son because you love the world so much. You are a steadfast, faithful God, and we love you in return. Lord, we thank you for answered prayers, for visas that have been granted for jobs that have been secured, for successful surgeries, for inspiring new purpose and hope in our lives. Make us grateful people for all the blessings you've showered upon us. We pray, Lord, for those who are having to make decisions in these days. Give them your wisdom. Show them the way. Make clear the path that you want them to take and grant them the courage to do what is right in your eyes. We pray for our families, Lord, those we love both near and far away. Protect them in their homes. Support them through times of difficulty and tension that they may grow together in love and understanding and rest content with one another. We pray for those who are sick or in trouble or in need of your healing touch this morning. We remember Bob Hurd visiting with his family out in Alberta. 
For Dehephred, as she recovers from yet another fall and another broken leg, facing another surgery today. We pray for Jonah's mom, Vanessa, who has had knee surgery and who's in a lot of pain. Relieve that, Lord, and bring recovery. And hear us now, Lord, as in the silence we name other people before you. Lord, touch and heal these ones in body, mind, and spirit. Restore them, Lord, with your mercy and with your power. We pray for peace and for justice in our world, for those suffering from the effects of war and oppression, the ravages of climate change, grinding poverty and hunger, by the power of your spirit, break down barriers of fear and hatred and let your blessing come down on those who are hurting today. We pray for the church. We pray for our own congregation. Keep us true to the gospel and responsive to the needs and gifts of all. Pour out your spirit upon us and make known your saving power in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to be faithful witnesses of your love. Inspire our worship. Deepen our fellowship. Help us to grow in the knowledge and grace of Christ. And help each one of us, Lord, to live this week with love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to offer our shared prayers to you. And you've promised through your Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and our petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. And now as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn is number 349. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Oh, yeah. 
friends, go forth now in the name of the Lord. This is God's charge to trust in Jesus Christ and to love one another as he has commanded. But now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.